Are you ready to up-level your performance, become a better sales coach, and grow revenue? Are you ready to be ready? Then ready, set, sell. I'm Hannah, a B2B sales enthusiast and sales consultant, advocating for sales to be a little more human. And I'm Tony from MindTickle, where I'm a sales leader and coach. And you're listening to Ready, Set, Sell, a podcast dedicated to helping revenue and sales professionals like you adopt a sales readiness approach to ensure your team is always ready to win. In each episode, we share smart insights, tangible advice, and actionable tips that can be applied directly to the work you do every day to drive organizational growth. Let's dive into the episode. In many ways, finding success in sales is all about your mindset. If you can maintain a flexible and optimistic mindset, no matter what's happening in the market around you, you'll already have a major advantage over the competition and a greater chance at achieving your goals. So in today's episode, we'll be exploring some of the key elements of sales success and what makes some companies thrive in challenging times while others fail. And we're sitting down with the president and founder of Engage Selling Solutions, Colleen Francis, to hear her top tricks of the trade and what she believes are the key qualities to embody as a sales leader today. Colleen also shares some of the most important lessons she's learned during her 20-year career in sales as a leader, coach, and author. So this is a conversation you won't want to miss. Hey, Colleen, welcome to the podcast. Really excited to have you here. Thanks so much. I am really excited to be here as well. So I see, um, you know, I I research and I I look at your profile and I see all these companies that you've worked with and I'm like, yes, okay, time to learn. So I'm really excited about giving everybody an opportunity to get to know you and and really get some special gems today. But um, we want to give the listeners a little bit of an opportunity to know a little bit of more about your career history, the direction you've taken so far, and um, and also just understand why sales? That's such a great question. I literally was born and bred a sales person. I mean, you know, I grew up in a household where my dad was a professional seller wow. and then became a sales manager and then the general manager of his firm. So it's always been in my my life. So it was kind of a natural progression for me when I graduated from university um, to jump into sales. I had a lot of friends who were in sales um, in the financial services sector. So that's where I started. And um, ultimately, I morphed into technology sales, um, which I really loved. And then um, really as a result of the first dot-com bubble um, bursting in, you know, what was that, 2000, I guess, 2001, um, I decided to go out on my own because where I live um, in Ottawa, Canada, there were a lot of tech companies who needed part-time sales VP um, advice, but they weren't ready to have a full-time salesperson. So my um, my journey into consulting really started as as putting myself out there as a part-time sales VP for a lot of companies, largely in the tech space. What what would you say led you to launch Engage Selling Solutions? Well, you know, we were, I was working for a startup technology uh, company and we were trying to raise money right when we were down in San Francisco, you know, on uh, (laughs) talking to VCs right when Cisco announced, um, I think it was in 2000, Q1 of 2000, that they weren't going to hit their numbers and the bottom started falling out of the stock market. Like, you know, the the dot-com bubble 1.0 crashed. And so we came back, we didn't have any uh, funding. Um, I was laid off. I thought, what am I going to do? And I kind of looked around and thought, you know, there's a lot of tech companies here who were in the position that my firm was who really shouldn't have hired me full time. Uh, We didn't really have a product to sell yet. Um, There was a lot of great technology, but they didn't need a full time sales VP. And so I decided to go out and just start looking at all of these little companies because what I'd love to do is build. Um, and I love to help companies grow markets and build and work in competitive industries and very sort of tough um, environments. And so I started doing that and then it morphed into, hey, Colleen, that's great, but can now you just come teach our sales VP what you did? Or can you just come teach our team what you're teaching the VP to do? So it really morphed from this virtual VP of of sales into a training and consulting um, and coaching business over of the course of the last uh, 20 years. Well, what would you say is really your current focus as the president of Engage Selling Solutions? Is there anything in particular like, hey, this is 
this is our, our, our main jam, so to speak, or this is what we really want to focus on. Do you have anything in particular? Yeah, the, the things that I'm really focused on right now are working with companies in highly competitive industries. Um, I love helping companies differentiate themselves in a highly competitive space, a very traditional space, um, where maybe even some of the products are purely commoditized, um, because I find that incredibly challenging. And in those spaces, what I love to work on is the implementation, accountability, and coaching. Because what I found is you can take almost any sales methodology. I mean, as long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, right? You can take any approach and any methodology and they all work if they're implemented correctly. And it's the implementation and the accountability that is often the failure. Um, sales managers are often unwilling or unable because they don't know how to hold their teams accountable. They don't pay attention to the numbers. They don't coach. They think it's nagging. They don't they don't want to micromanage. They leave their top performers alone, and so they never understand how or why that top performer is as good as they are. And to me, um, that leaves a huge hole in the organization. Mm. There's this fear internally at organizations where they just, I can't take my guys and girls out the field. Like, they can't. I need them trained. They don't know what they're doing, but if I just take them away from clients for one hour, it's just too much time. It's, it's too much time, and it's, it's this weird kind of um, just this conflict internally where there, there has to be trust. He's talking about this accountability and yeah. really like we're, we're implementing these changes, but they're just, they're just going to learn it in the field. We're going to just like send them an email and hopefully yeah. it, it makes it work. <laughs> so yeah, like the, the, the need for, for people to come in and really hold the organizations accountable. I think that's just going to keep increasing with, with, with things changing so much. But um, thinking, about, yeah, thinking about that change and if you think about the last two years and how many companies have had to say, okay, virtual is a thing now. We have no choice. Like people are going to spend, yeah. you know, half a million, seven figures, over, over Zoom and all the other applications that you can use for virtual selling. Um, yeah. But like, how, how did you find the switch to virtual? But more specifically, how did you handle those conversations with clients who may have been quite reluctant to, to kind of just fall in line to some degree? So it was a really interesting transition for us because at the time that COVID hit, um, 90% of our customers were considered essential services. So oil and gas, manufacturing, um, agricultural services, agricultural products. So they had to be active and they were allowed in many cases to be in the field. Uh, company by company, I mean, some companies locked down, but because they were essential services, they literally were you know, allowed to, to travel. Um, yet they often couldn't because their clients <laughs> had locked them out. And I saw two things happen. I saw some companies embrace it immediately. We saw some fantastic examples of companies that converted offices into video conferencing rooms so their guys didn't have to worry about the setup and the lights and they, they set that all up. Um, and I saw some, especially in the traditional markets where the, the sellers were, you know, are, are more tenured, um, just cross their arms and say, I'm waiting this out until I can get out to see my customers physically, I'm not going back on site. And those guys, kind of thought this was going to be a month long problem. <laughs> and, when, <laughs> month long and when they realized <laughs> that their customers were embracing this and if they were careful, their competition would take that business, um, they got into line pretty quickly. And now as a result, we're seeing a bit of a balance, but two things have happened. Their ownership and their bosses have realized just how powerful inside sales can be. And Hannah, like you said, there's large scale, six figure deals being transactioned over Zoom, and if you think about how much more profitable that is, as opposed to a flight or a drive or a hotel oh, stay, yeah. people have recognized that, right? Mm -hmm. And so the smartest salespeople have really looked at this and went, wow, this is gonna make me more money. You know, clearly, Colleen, you have such a diverse background, uh, not only from your corporate background, but you know, I notice you're also a member of the Speaking Hall of Fame, uh, which is awesome, by the way. Yeah. Um, but you're also an author. So I wanted to ask you about uh, yes. your latest book, which is called Right on the Money. Uh, what, what's the focus of the I book and so. what can sales <laughs> leaders learn from it? So the focus of the book is really about balancing a customer centric approach with an internal metric. So what I call sales velocity approach. So I find often companies spend too much time focused on one or the other. 
They believe the customer is always right and they have incredibly customer centric um, policies on <clears throat> returns and discounts and, and services that drive them into um, low profitability or slow down of growth. Um, or they have these really internal um, focus metrics where they just drive um, sale, 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 you know, always be closing at all costs, which are incredibly customer um, repellent. And the best companies actually balance. They understand that they have to have this balance between um, internal corporate metrics that meet the needs of the, of the new buyer in the market. And so the book is really focused on how to do that. <laughs> <clears throat> Colleen, you've spoken a bit about the work that, well, your work as stepping in as a, as a sales leader, but also in, in supporting and coaching sales leaders to success. What would you say, just considering the, the, the world we're operating in now, what would you say excites you most about the work you're currently doing with some of the sales leaders? The work, uh, what excites me the most right now is watching sales leaders coach their teams um, in a new and different way. So Hannah, you made a comment earlier about how sales leaders um, have sometimes had this attitude of we can't pull the team out for an hour, let alone a day for sales training, right? During the pandemic, we actually saw an over-rotation of a lot of training because they're you know, with people not traveling and people not in the office, they often said, hey, we're gonna use that sort of normal downtime now for training. So what we're seeing and what I'm helping implement are all sorts of, um, if I could call them micro-training or micro coaching type environments where we're having we're doing a lot of team selling so people are coaching um, as they're going and learning from each other we're seeing managers because of this remote environment on more um, group sales calls than ever before whereas it may not have always been possible for a manager to fly you know or drive with a sales rep they can log in remotely Tony, you've had a few years in sales, so I'd be really curious to understand a bit more about like, how you feel the sales landscape's changed since you first started your career. Well, gosh, I mean, Hannah, I'm pretty much a dinosaur at this point. We didn't even use calculators. I used an abacus back when I first started in order to put quotes together. But I, I think it's really about how you get in front of people nowadays. There's so many different opportunities and ways that you can actually contact folks that you really need to differentiate yourself. So finding out the best way to get in front of people and do something that's going to differentiate your message and your organization is really some things that have changed dramatically over the last couple of years, especially. So I've been in sales for f almost 15 years now. And in the beginning, you, you know, you had your script, you had what you're going to say, you had your product. It's never like a completely saturated market where you're competing with 5,000 other tools or, or solutions. It was like almost the only way in a lot of situations um, to do things or to do things in a better way. And you just call and meet customers until they, <laughs> until they broke. <laughs> um, but no, but it, honestly, what, the biggest thing I've seen change is, is that there is, there's a lot of choice, which means the ways in which we have to interact with buyers has changed. And I feel like that's the biggest thing that I've seen outside of course, technology and all those and all those fancy things. It's really just having to be not just a salesperson who pitches and can go out and take someone for dinner. It's really somebody who is good at understanding how you uncover problems, understanding how you help a company to kind of identify that they, you know, raise their awareness of their own problems or opportunities that they can take advantage of. And, and just being a kind of a partner, I like to use the word trusted advisor to prospective buyers rather than just that sales person who's very irritating. That's the biggest thing I've seen change. To your point, the, the industry was so much in its early stages at that point. I worked at a, a help desk company. No one even knew what a help desk was at that point. So I had to become a trusted advisor almost immediately because we had to teach people what it was that not only we were selling, but what, why people really needed this. Nowadays, buyers are, they're, they're, they're just so much, they're, they're, they're more informed. It's like, if I think 15 years back, Google was in its infancy. So, you know, you'd call up and they just take what your word for it, right? 
there wasn't really this alternative space. There wasn't a Slack community. There wasn't meetups. There wasn't so much information on Google where you could search it and just end up at, you know, 25 other competitors' websites. It was more a case of listening to a salesperson, seeing if it makes sense, particularly for like the, the lower end uh, solutions where you're only spending maybe less than 50 grand. Yeah, and they even have great podcasts they can turn to for information as well. I've, I've heard that somewhere. Yeah, I, I, this new podcast thing, I think is really going to take off. Even the most challenging circumstances, like say, hmm, a world pandemic, can be viewed as a chance for growth opportunity. In today's high-risk market, it's more important than ever for organizations to set themselves apart from the competition to earn their buyer's trust early on. As Colleen suggests, taking the extra time to analyze your wins and losses as a team is well worth it if it can help you replicate success in the future. And I think what Colleen said about the implementation of sales methodologies being the real challenge is really on point. It's sort of the same thing as trying to live a healthier lifestyle. It's rarely the diet or exercise plan itself that's the problem, but putting it into practice day after day that people really find challenging. Agreed. Let's hear more of Colleen's perspective on adopting a growth mindset to embrace change. Well, Colleen, the last two years have obviously seen some massive changes across the board and, you know, it's affected people and groups in different ways. Um, how would you say the overall sales industry has really been affected over the last couple of years? So a couple of things. Um, one, it's still what I consider a high risk sales environment. And so decision confidence with buyers is really low. And what's changed is that sellers need to work really hard to help buyers have confidence in making a decision. Now, when I say decision confidence, I don't mean that they have confidence or trust or lack of in a salesperson, just in their own ability to make a decision because they're thinking, oh man, like we lost money a couple of years ago and I've got five, you know, five open head count and I'm making all this thing by myself. What if I make a wrong decision? Maybe I should just stay the course. Maybe I should just do nothing. So sellers have to cut through all that noise and not just work to build trust in themselves, their company, their products, but also in the customer, right? The customer has to have trust in themselves and we play a big role um, in doing that. So that's one thing that has really changed. Um, the other thing that's changed or become more exaggerated is the fact that, and I think it was Gartner's latest study showed that um, almost, it was about 40%, maybe as high as 44% of buyers, stakeholders in the buying system, when asked, would prefer a sellerless experience. Now, they're not getting it in the B2B world, mostly, but they would prefer it. And, and I mean, and think about what's happened in the last two years, right? We've bought everything online. I mean, no one's even going to the grocery store anymore. So their mindset is, well, if I can buy all that stuff online, then why can't I buy my business services and business products? You know, those are two of the biggest uh, changes, dramatic changes that we've seen. Why do you think it's so important that sales leaders um, start to embrace that flexible and um, like adaptable mindset today? What I noticed coming through this is the sales leaders who paid really close attention to the data, really close attention to the data, like, like became like intimate with their numbers on an on a hourly basis and coached to what the trends were happening. Um, and changed as they were going, were the ones who were successful. Um, and those who kind of took a laid back approach and just kind of continued, we'll wait and see, we'll continue having our pipeline calls once a month, or I'm not going to pay it, don't, I'm not going to worry about the top performers who are starting to trend down because they'll, you know, they'll pick themselves up by the end of the year um, and took a bit of a hands-off approach, um, which you could do when the market was buoyant. Um, they didn't. Um, succeed. And one of my clients said to me, you know, Colleen, what the pandemic did for us was really expose just how weak we were in certain aspects of sales and in coaching. But the mistakes that we made when the market was buoyant um, were completely glossed over. So that's what I, that's why I think it's so critical that they pay attention to the data, um, pay attention to the coaching, pay attention to the micro trends, which can become macro <laughs> you know, any day. It's, it's, no, I, I agree with you actually there um, because there is the, there is constant change and you do have to keep just being, I like that, following those like micro trends. That's pretty key. It, do you think there's something about, um, you know, it, particularly when your sales leaders are looking after junior teams where it's like, 
okay, we're going to try this this week and we're going to try this this week and we're going to try this this week, that there's like a, a bit, there's a need for balance. Like, let's have a little bit of consistency <laughs> before, because it yeah, just seems a little bit Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's very few markets where changing every week is a good idea. Um, but I think in a marketplace, especially like we've come out of and like we're still in waiting a quarter to assess results, do win-loss analysis, um, assess how the quarter went is too late mm -hmm. because, I mean, whether it's supply chain or price increases or, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be, you just can't, uh, you're, you're already too far behind. Oh, yeah, point. I think from a coaching perspective, especially, right, you really have to change your mindset to focus on the things that are, are, are fast moving and are really going to be most impactful across the org, right? Um, but with yeah. that in mind, uh, what would you say some of your recommendations are for you know, adapting a new growth mindset and really learning to go with the flow of change in throughout the uh, throughout the org? Yeah, that's hard because you know change is hard for people, right? What people the mistake that um, leaders make with a growth mindset is that they don't manage they don't manage the change management portion of it. So they say to people, hey guys, we're gonna, we need to grow 30% this year. That can feel overwhelming. You know, a salesperson's going, but I did a million dollars. You want me to do a million three plus I have to manage all of my clients? How the heck am I gonna get there? And you know, salespeople are divas, um, you know, <laughs> which is fine, <laughs> but we have to use that to our advantage, right? So we have to use tools like sales velocity, uh, which I love, or some basic sales math to say, here's what that looks like. What I need from you is X number of opportunities a day or X number of calls a day. And you know what? For the first month, we're just going to measure progress to filling up the pipeline. And you celebrate the fact that they're making progress, not just the fact that they have won 30% more business. And the only way we found to be successful is to be really consistent in the accountability and managing the change. So weekly calls, uh, you know, bi-weekly sales team meetings, uh, bi-weekly one-on-one um, -on -one coaching calls, celebrating success along the way, um, incremental change, reinforcement of that. Um, it's like going back to batting practice on a regular basis, right? If you're trying to change your golf swing or you're trying to hit more home runs, you've got to get into the practice arena and practice on an ongoing basis, not just say, ah, it's game day, I'll try it. I'll try something new. Ah, that didn't work, so I won't try it again, right? <laughs> yeah. You get a new number every year, right? January 1, you're starting at zero, right? So you need to be able to feel, yeah. yes, I feel supported. There, There's going to be success here, and these are the things that are really going to help drive me in the direction that I need to be. I was looking at um, one of your blogs, uh, Colleen, around four ways to leverage your perspectives. And if you don't mind, I just want to read a sentence and I'd love you to expand on this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, so, so you said something about, um, you know, prospects are expecting more meaningful connections, right? So it's like one that's earned through, and I love this, one that's earned through sincerity, empathy, and legwork. Now, I I'm thinking about how you, like, at the same time where we want to see this change happen over that quarter, two quarters, 16 mm -hmm. months, how do, how do we get and support sales leaders to actually do that thing, nurture and help their sales people to build meaningful connections in this digital space? So there's both a quantity and a quality um, equation going on here. So the first thing is sales leaders need to coach um, sellers to be building multiple relationships inside accounts and not just get complacent with a single stakeholder. So I believe that they need to look at opportunities and really push their sales teams to say, hey, you've got a, a one fantastic relationship with Hannah and you're talking to her on a weekly basis, but she's the only one you're talking to. And this is a, you know, half a million dollar deal. <laughs> There's got to be other stakeholders, you know, high and, and low inside the organization. So teaching salespeople how the value that they bring can be expanded across the organization, I think is really critical. Um, so that's sort of the quantity side. Um, on the quality side, I think what's really important is this, uh, I, I like to call it opera operationalizing, I can't, even, can't say it today, operationalizing value. Ah. So what I think sellers need to, to figure out is how the value of what they're bringing affects the person they're talking to both personally and professionally. 
um, how it affects their team, how it affects the entire organization. Uh, because then they can have incredibly meaningful conversations about not just you know saving people money, but reducing costs, about um, reducing stress, about reducing turnover, about making their organization more efficient, about um, building better cultures. Claims. <laughs> Now, you mentioned relationships, and uh, I, I want to pivot slightly on that because uh, one of the tools I use almost, I'm, I'm basically an addict uh, to LinkedIn, right? Because of all the relationships you can yeah. find and see there. And you know, I was researching uh, y- yourself on there, and you said something which really caught my eye, and I want to kind of get your thoughts on it. So in your bio, you actually said, I want to make sure I get this right, uh, in today's modern selling era, we should expect 100% of the sales teams to hit 100% of the quota. Now, I, I, I read that and I'm like, whoa, that is, uh, <laughs> that, that is a lofty <laughs> statement. So why do you believe this and how can teams really achieve it? So I, there's two things going on here. Um, one, you know, I truly believe that you know, selling is not rocket science, right? Um, and Companies set goals that in most cases are attainable. Um, and if they can attain it from a corporate perspective, they should have people who are able to hit those targets. Uh, you know, I sometimes I look at organizations and I think, like, sellers are maybe the only profession who get away. We're not, well, weathermen. We're the only ones who are allowed to fail two thirds of the time. Like, imagine. You know, if you had truck drivers come back and say, yeah, I just didn't, del- I didn't deliver two thirds of the loads today. Sorry, guys. I also don't believe that all sellers should have the same targets. And I think that is the big mistake that a lot of companies make. Interesting. Is, you know, if we go back to that 30% growth, um, there are some sellers who are in such saturated markets. There's no way given they manage a book of business that, you know, is 150, 200, 300 clients and you expect them to grow 30%. Yet then there's a seller in a greenfield market who could probably double their business. So I believe that part of the mistake is that sales leaders have this, well, everyone has to have the same size um, target or everyone has to grow the same regardless of their size and their their market capacity. Instead, we should be setting targets that hit the corporate goal that are also relevant to the market space that you're in, the industries you're serving, um, the market penetration that you have and then provide the tools to help um, the sales team grow. We've spoken a lot about change and embracing change. Um, and we know that buyers have changed the way they engage with salespeople. That's just like, that's just fact. Um, what would you say are some of the key predictions then for the next few years when it comes to the sales industry? What are you seeing? What are you thinking? <laughs> well, I'm thinking we're going to see more and more of a move to hybrid. So this environment where we're both um, out in the field selling um, and virtually selling, um, I think we're going to see a shift in um, the way teams have traditionally rolled out their um, BDS or BDR um, teams to be more sophisticated. And I think we're going to see companies embrace a notion of um, different targets and different pay structures for different people. Um, I'm already starting to see some companies realize, based on the situation, whether it's the seller's situation, the market conditions, the market situation, um, that we can have bespoke um, tailoring of compensation plans for sellers based on um, what the company needs of them and what they um, are likely to accomplish given their situation. Interesting. I love the reorientation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, nowadays, um, it's it seems like there are just so many different voices out there, right? Between podcasts and articles and conferences, and now that everything being virtual, there's so much uh, influx of information. Um, how would you say that your approach is different from other sales leaders in the industry right now? Well, one of the things that I do to differentiate myself is I, I like to say that I'm process agnostic. So uh, you could be rolling out, I mean, like I said earlier, virtually any sales process, as long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, um, and I'm the implementation specialist. So, you know, if you have embraced challenger selling, or if you've embraced spin selling, and it's embedded into your CRM, and, you know, and it's been working for you historically, uh, that's fine. I'm not going to come in and necessarily tell you that the process has to be changed, 
What I am going to do is show you how to nuance and improve that process and improve the implementation and accountability so that you can really make it sing. You know, this has been extremely insightful, interesting. Uh, you've had some fantastic answers, but you know, Colleen, we're not done with you yet. We have a little bit more to okay. go. We're going to have a little bit of fun now. Um, we're going to do some rapid fire okay. questions. Uh -oh. Not that we haven't had some fun so far, but we're going to take it to a very quick rapid fire question. So we're going to throw some questions out with you. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, just throw it out there and I'll let, uh, I'll let Hannah kick it off. So what is your sales philosophy in just three words? <laughs> Have fun, get to work and be nice. Oh, three mini phrases. I like. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've been given in your career? Best piece of advice I've ever been given is my dad, um, who always just used to look at me and say, suck it up, princess. <laughs> yes. I love that. <laughs> dad. So I was going to say that's the first time we've ever had like fatherly advice on there. That's yeah. awesome. I love it. What would you say is your top productivity hack? My top productivity hack um, has always been to time block. So to make sure that I, you know, if I have to do something, I block the time in my calendar and set a start time, but also an end time. Yeah, I'm, that's a really good one. I'm just like, I, I need to talk to you about that, Colleen. You need to help me with that a bit. <laughs> um, so if you could share just one piece of advice to all sales professionals, what would it be? It would be to constantly work on the front end of your sales cycle. So the best way to ensure that you always hit your goal is to have a steady flow of high quality leads in the top end of your pipeline because you're never going to close 100%. And what happens if you don't, if you manage your pipeline too lean, you will always resort to tricks and tactics and discounts to try to get things closed. Um, and it still isn't going to work. Colleen, where do you go to get your industry news? I go to LinkedIn. I follow a lot of, um, you know, other sales professionals, and, and I specifically follow the work of um, the experts at Gartner. Hmm. I think Brett Adamson is doing some of the best research and forward thinking research on not just sellers, but buyers hmm. um, as well. Uh, what are the top three apps that you could not live without? TripIt, Google Maps, and my Peloton app. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Oh, man, I love that. So what do you think, Colleen? Are leaders made or born? Leaders are made. Perfect. What book has inspired you the most in your career? Um, Alan Weiss's Million Dollar Consulting. Interesting. Great book. Great, great book. Okay. Well, Colin, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, if if you want to mention your book one more time, we'll get it out there. But uh, we'd love to have you on the podcast. And thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for having me. This has been a great fun. Um, and yes, my book is right on the money. Um, it's available on our website, engagedselling.com, or of course, uh, anywhere you like to buy books online. Mm. Tony, adopting a digital mindset is essential, right? In in this modern sales landscape, like you can't escape it. You, you have to understand how digital works and really be in that frame of mind. So, what are some new digital innovations you're excited about right now? Gosh, well, I think we've already established the fact that I'm a dinosaur, right? So change for me is always hard. But uh, <laughs> one of the things that I've been really excited about is uh, we've actually implemented something new, a, a partner of ours called Boost Up, and Boost Up gives me the opportunity to actually view all of my opportunities and all of my forecasting right from one screen. So it actually ties in with our Call AI tool to be able to give me much better insight into what's happening with all the deals, how can I tie all the information together, how engaged is everyone, uh, and I can do it all from one screen. Whereas you know before I used to have to go to all these different places, each person would be different, this just saves me so much time and energy. And again, I hate, I hate to be a self plugger, but that's what we do. And then it gives me the opportunity to do things a lot faster and a lot easier. So I, I think that thing has saved me so much time 
and you know, I'm just excited by it, getting to the opportunity to use it all the times. You know what? That sounds amazing. And if I think about the, the sales leaders that I work with day to day, and they're like, we just want to get everything in one place. Like, I, I, I would need to see what's going on. I need to know what to look at, particularly when you've got a big team and there's hundreds of records. It's it's so difficult to try and do that manually or get or just lean on your team completely. So that sounds like some awesome tech. For me, it's I'm always thinking of like things that just make life easier, particularly for salespeople, right? Salespeople just they want to sell, but the statistics say that they only spend about 5% of their time selling. So I'm still trying to work out what the other 60% of time is spent doing, but well, well, that's another episode, right? I'd say at least 10% of the time is spent listening to Ready, Set, Sell podcasts. Which is actually in the job description. I've seen it in a lot of job <laughs> descriptions now. So I'm, I'm happy that we're, we're really making an impact. But um, I like tools like, um, I know there's Dooley, but I, I use Scratchpad. So Scratchpad is a great, it's like um, a UI that sits over Salesforce. So you actually never have to go into Salesforce. It's almost like Apple Notes. You just add stuff and it just goes into all of the fields it's supposed to go in all across opportunities, contacts, leads, and accounts. You can build like list views and I'll look at everything that we're working on at any given time. And I'm, you know, I'm practice lead now, so I'm looking at invoices and all the boring admin stuff. But it's interesting because it's just so much quicker. Like I'd have to go into 20 or 30 records every day and I just look at one screen and everything's there. And if my team update me, I can just update one field and it updates everything. So those tools that are helping with sales productivity and also sales enablement, some, I don't know, this mind tickle tool I've heard about a few times, it really, um, for me, is really changing the game. Well, it sounds like for the both of us, uh, if it saves time, we're excited about it. Although, I also did a little bit of research while you were just talking there. I think anywhere between 5 to 25% of salespeople's time is spent with a cocktail in their hands celebrating that last deal that they had. So I had to bring it full circle back to the cocktails, and that always that always works for me as well. I don't know about you, but you know, every once in a while, you just got to kick back and you know assess where you're at. Colleen made some excellent points about change management, sales relationships, and leadership. One of the things that really stood out to me from our conversation was the strong emphasis Colleen places on mindset, maintaining a sense of optimism and willingness to change, even in the most challenging times, will serve you well as a sales leader in today's turbulent world. And Tony, when it comes to change management, it's one thing to devote time to planning, strategizing, and developing a sales methodology for success, but it's quite another to put it into practice in reality. Colleen reminds us that in addition to setting smart goals, leaders need to focus on charting a course to help their teams get there. Absolutely true. And, and finally, I think relationship building is a crucial component of sales success. By engaging multiple stakeholders in rapport building conversations regularly and providing tangible value to their business, salespeople will have a better chance of differentiating themselves from the competition. Thank you for listening to this episode of Ready, Set, Sell. We hope you took away some valuable lessons and insights that inspire you to reevaluate your approach to sales readiness. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show when you get a minute. And stay tuned for the next episode of Ready, Set, Sell.